I told Jackson, I said, I'm too busy this morning. You just take my Bible and go up there and preach. Uh, he did a great job last Sunday night if you were here. Uh, if you weren't, that was your loss. Uh, he did a great job preaching his first sermon here at our church, uh, and we hope to hear him many, many more times. He got us out. Service lasted 38 minutes because uh, I told him to keep it short and sweet because we had spaghetti to eat. So he made the promise that if he gets up to preach on a Sunday morning to expect about 45, 50, two and a half hours, whatever. Uh, so, um, any of y'all been on Facebook and seen all those families from Mount Vernon eating at their supper table? I don't know if y'all seen those getting shared around. That's his dad's fault. You go watch. They're all, you can see what everybody at Mount Vernon's eating for supper. They keep putting it on Facebook this week. Uh, anyway, I'm catching my breath is why I'm stalling because this has been a, a chaos kind of morning, but God is good. Amen. Amen. This morning we celebrate two baptisms. Uh, we celebrate, uh, Significant uh, for me is it's the first time I've ever gotten the privilege of baptizing a husband and wife uh, who are new believers in Christ. Uh, so Destiny and Jeremy will be coming sometime uh, this morning to be baptized. Uh, Destiny, of course, came uh, forward last Sunday, and then Jeremy called me uh, Tuesday afternoon from, were you in the parking lot or the break room? From Ermco. Uh, salvation happens at Ermco. Uh, you ought to put that on the T-shirt. Uh, but God can work anywhere. God can get a hold of a heart uh, anywhere and any time and in any way that he pleases. Uh, and so we rejoice this morning. Uh, and we will be celebrating that here in just a few minutes. Uh, but first we're going to take a little time in the book of Isaiah. A great book of Old Testament prophecy. Uh, Isaiah covers a whole lot uh, to say the least. Isaiah walks through judgment, Isaiah walks through blessing, Isaiah walks through longing and hurt and rebellion and exile, Israelites, God's people getting kicked out of their home country. Um, in fact, Isaiah is one of the major prophets. doesn't mean he was more important, it just means his book is longer. We're going to be in uh, chapter 51, if I hadn't said that already. Chapter 51 uh, of Isaiah this morning. And just to set the scene, God has spoken through Isaiah. Now the Israelites, the people of Israel, are God's chosen people, right? They were chosen by God. Uh, they were given a plan uh, to basically go out and be God's holy nation. Of course, God begins to promise through Israel would come a Messiah, a Savior, a Redeemer, one who would come to set captives free. And the Israelites thought that they were going to have a great leader come up and make the nation of Israel this great and mighty superpower uh, on the world stage. But God tends to operate a little different from the way that we often think God should or might or would operate. Um, and things begin to look a little different. Israel, they weren't the best examples of how to be followers of God. They would do all right for a little bit, and then they'd get off track. They'd get back on track. They'd get off track. They would uh, get all caught up with some foreign gods, and God would call them back, or God would punish them, and there was just this ebb and flow of, of obedience, disobedience, this cycle of them following God and God judging, and finally gets to the point God sends people in to run them out of their homeland, to overtake them, to overthrow them, and it looks hopeless. Well, through Isaiah, God begins to prophesy that he's not done with his children. He's not done with his people. And in the chapters preceding chapter 51, in kind of the run-up to it, he begins to talk about this servant who is going to come, this servant who's going to, to come into the nation of Israel and is going to, to suffer, is going to be persecuted, is going to go through turmoil. It doesn't make sense. Of course, we, looking back, right, it's easy to look backwards and say, oh, that's Jesus. And here, after he's been teaching about his servant, he begins to look back at his people to give them some hope, to give them a glimmer that things are going to be okay. And in verse or chapter 51, starting in the first verse, prophet Isaiah writes, Listen to me. Now these are the words directly from the mouth of God that Isaiah writes. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole out of, of the pit from which you were dug. 
Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Listen to me, my people, and give ear to me, O my nation. For the law will proceed from me. And I will make my justice rest. As a light of the peoples, my righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. Lift your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke, and the earth will grow old like a garment. And those who dwell in it will die in like manner. Now, I could stop right there and everything would be real depressing. I like to point that out. But here we get that but God moment. Last two lines of verse 6. But my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your word that was spoken so long ago through the prophet Isaiah. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation that you sent that never fades, that will never be destroyed, that will never be removed. Lord, I pray that today we would see that you bring life out of death and brokenness. Let us trust in you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I have to be careful because I'm used to... Did y'all know there's a clock in the balcony? Y'all can't... Y'all do. Of course y'all knew that. Uh, It's supposed to keep us on track. And I'm used to stepping up to the pulpit around 15 after, 10 after. I got up here at 5 till. So if I preach all the way around to my normal time, y'all are going to be really exhausted and really hungry. So I'm going to have to keep, uh, Jackson, you'll be my timekeeper, okay? Now, I don't need you keeping time. Uh, Of course you will, Jeff. I need seven and a half minutes. Go. Jeff would have started keeping time five minutes before service started. Uh, Anyway, this morning I want us to look at a few things that that God gives us here. Notice, remember, these people are coming out of brokenness. They're coming out of judgment. They're coming out of rebellion. They're coming out of exile. And God immediately says, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Now, I want us to think about that for just one second. Notice God jumps in and he says, listen to me. This is like God, that point, he's like any of us listening to a sermon, right? You know, you're not listening along and then the preacher says, hey, listen up, listen to me. And you tune back in. Some of you that might have already tuned out, you thought I was talking to you just then. But God is saying, hey, through all of this, this has been a very long book up until this point. We're already 50 chapters in of going through a bunch of prophecy. Whoa, I like that. Going through a bunch of, what would you say? Don't threaten me. (laughs) Sound guys. God's saying, listen, tune back in. If you've gotten worried, if you think all of this that's coming has you distressed, if you don't know what's going to happen, listen back up. Tune your ears in. And who's he telling to follow or to listen in? He says, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. He's saying, my people. Now notice these are two distinguishing marks of somebody who's following God. People who follow after righteousness and people who seek the Lord. Now notice, it doesn't say those of you who have figured righteousness out. It says those who follow after righteousness. Why? Because we don't have any righteousness of our own. We are not perfect people. Some of you might be, but I'm not. The Bible tells us there's none that's righteous. There's none that's holy. Except for who? Except for Jesus Christ. The only righteousness that we can lay claim to is the righteousness given to us by faith in Christ. We are not right. Y'all knew that about me. We are not holy, but we can follow after it. We can seek the Lord. The Christian journey, this moment that we celebrate here shortly of baptism, is not a final point in some kind of journey. It's a starting point. 
that the highlight, yeah, the, well, baptism is a highlight of the Christian life. But it's not the point where you reach the mountaintop and say, I'm done. I am a Christian. I have been baptized. I'm part of the church. It's done. Now, that's the, the point where it begins. That's why we talk about baptism as a first act of obedience for a new believer in Christ. This isn't a sermon on baptism, but we're about to see this illustration. Then what is the rest of the Christian life? It's not sitting back with the Lord and being righteous. No, it's a life where we continue to follow His righteousness as it guides us and to seek after Him. Why do we do this? Well, Jesus tells us there's a good thing to do, that it's a good thing to do. In the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, it'll pop up on the screen. This is where Jesus gives us a whole bunch of things that, that are part of different people's lives and things we should strive after and promises a blessing. And he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, I don't know if you've ever been really thirsty. You ever been really thirsty? Like, like really thirsty. Like, could, never mind. I'm going to say you could drink a whole gallon of milk. Milk quenches my thirst. I'm one of those weird people. I could come in on a hot day. Hannah can tell you this. I come in on a hot day and pour a big tall glass of milk, and it just soothes my soul. Uh, may not soothe my stomach, but it soothes my soul. When I was in college, I went hiking through East Tennessee. I may have shared this with you all, and so I'll tell it quick. Went hiking with a friend through East Tennessee. And we took some supplies, but we didn't realize that on that long hike, uh, with just the two of us hiking out there with our backpacks and a tent that we could roll up and carry on our backs, uh, we started running low on water. It was fall break. It wasn't going to be too hot, but it, summer in Tennessee, or fall in Tennessee, is just like summer light uh, in a whole bunch of other places. Um, so we're hiking, and it gets warm. Did you know you can hike high enough up the mountain? I thought, we'll be fine. We brought water filters and stuff, and... We can just, there's creeks. You're in the mountains, right? That's what you go for. There's creeks and streams everywhere you turn around. Do you know you can hike high enough that there ain't no more creeks? And we did. We kept hiking and getting thirstier, hiking and getting thirstier. And I'm starting to get a little worried. Then finally we crossed the summit of the mountain and we entered North Carolina. Y'all, I love my home state, but I was never so glad to be out of Tennessee because that meant something. It meant the downhill slope was starting again. Now, we could have, if we were smart, we'd have just turned around and went back the other way where there was water. But we had to prove our point, right? We had to get where we were going. We crossed into North Carolina, and about 100 yards across the North Carolina line was a little tiny creek, about that wide, little stream. And, y'all, we took those straw, these filtration straw things, and I probably drank eight and a half gallons of water sitting there. It is a miracle those things worked because I'd have gotten 74 kinds of parasites if they wouldn't have had filtration out of how much creek water I drank. But it was life-giving. It was nourishing. It was refreshing. Why? Because we were truly thirsting. And my fear is that in our churches today, we don't truly hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God. We get comfortable. We get complacent. And we, can, we quit seeking it. We quit following after it. We quit desiring to grow in God. But what's the promise of Jesus? If you hunger and thirst for it, what's going to happen? He will fill you. You will find fulfillment. If you go seeking after God's will, you're not going to walk away empty-handed. You know another mistake churches make today, particularly in this country, is we misread that verse. And rather than hungering and thirsting for the righteousness, you know what we hunger and thirst for? The blessing. We go and seek after the blessedness. We don't go seeking after the righteousness that leads to blessing. He doesn't say, blessed are you who seek the blessing, for you shall be filled. He says, blessed are you who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. We don't need to pursue the things of God just to receive the blessing of God, but rather we pursue them because of what they are. We follow God because of who He is. We follow the Lord because His righteousness is the way that we should go. And then in that, God blesses us. So that's all a big definition that Isaiah kind of gives us, or God gives us in Isaiah, of what it means to kind of be this Christian, to be this follower of God. Of course, these were Jews at the time. And he says, those of you that are following me, listen to what I got to say. 
He says, look to the rock from which you were hewn. This is the second half of verse 1. And to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. He's given an illustration of, of like a rock quarry. Saying, you know, anytime we just spend a couple of days, my in-laws are here from way up yonder across the, well, you go to the Mason-Dixon line, then you go to the border, and then you cross in, and that's where they're from. Uh, north of the north in Canada. And we went up yesterday or Thursday and spent a couple of nights in the Ozarks in Arkansas. And have you ever noticed when you get past Pocahontas and you're up there in the Ozarks, uh, Pocahontas the town, not the person, uh, very different, or the Disney movie. What do you start seeing on a lot of the buildings? You start seeing that Ozark Mountain rock, don't you? I love that. There are churches up there that are just built out of that Ozark stone. All of that rock had to be cut out of a mountain. And he makes this comparison here that God's people came from somewhere. And he says, let's consider where you got your start. We're talking to the Jewish people in particular. He goes back to the Jewish people and he says, look, you have come from Abraham and Sarah. Go all the way back. If you don't know that story, that's your homework to go read the story of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah, God looks at Abraham and says, hey, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make a great nation out of you and I'm going to do great things with you and I'm going to establish people out of you. Your descendants are going to be numerous. What's the problem there? Abraham and Sarah were, Sarah were real old. They weren't having kids by man's calculation. But what does God do? He miraculously sends a child who has more children and more children, and Abraham's nation grows. And what God is saying is, listen, y'all, my people, the ones who are trying to follow after me, the ones who are seeking after me, when everything looks hopeless and lifeless, let's think about how you got your start. With a man and a woman who never should have been able to have children, but because of me, I called him, I had a purpose and a plan, and I blessed and I increased. God brings life out of barrenness. God brings hope out of brokenness. God brings beauty when everything else seems like it's crashing in. And we have the audacity to doubt him. We have the audacity to question to wonder if he is strong enough. He says, think all the way back to where you got your start. Fletcher, I might have just heard his name back there. I broke the TV in the cry room. I'm in trouble. Uh, but I put a radio back there, so all's good. Fletcher has gotten, he's becoming an outdoor adventurer. He likes to explore the backyard. He has got a nature walk bucket that is really just an old cheese puffs jar. Uh, you know the big ones. After two sermons and the chaos this morning, I could sit down in my recliner with a jar of those cheese puffs. Anyway, um, he's got one of those, and he's been filling it with sticks and rocks and dirt. There's a couple of worms in there. Y'all pray for those worms. They might be with the Lord. Um, just whatever he finds outside, he wants to stick in it. But we had a flower pot outside at our house, and a little flower pot, and he said, I'm going to plant something. Okay, have at it, buddy. He got some dirt out of the yard. He got some sticks out of the yard. He got some grass clippings because the plant needed grass. He got uh, the little purple berries that grow on the monkey grass. Right, buddy? He's listening intently. Um, he put it all into this flower pot. Okay? You don't know what's in it. Oh, what? There weren't any seeds. He said, I'm going to grow something. He, go for it, buddy. He said, I'm going to water it, and he has. Oh, bless his heart, that plant or that bundle of stuff has gotten water and water, and he said, and it needs sunshine. So he put it right on the front of the porch. Beautiful decoration right on our front porch. All right, buddy. Of course, I'm not going to go with his ears listening into what me as the grown and educated adult was thinking, right? Till I walked in one day last week. Daddy, I've got something to show you. And if that stinker didn't walk me out on the front porch and show me three little seedlings that had sprouted up from the collection of whatnot that was he had watered and he had put in the sunshine and are now growing into plants. I don't know what he's growing. It could come out to be a poison oak vine that we're going to have decorative on our front porch if y'all want to come get some for your house. But he's growing something. Why? 
Because what we looked at and what our logic would say isn't going to work when it was cared for and nurtured by someone who cared and deeply cared. Life sprang from barrenness. God looks and he says, look, this looks hopeless. This looks broken. This looks messed up. I'm going to take these old people that shouldn't have children. I'm going to make a nation out of them. He looks at us and says, these sinners who reject me, these sinners who hate me, these sinners who've turned their back on me, I'm going to come into this world and I'm going to bring life. Y'all, those people that you pray for, that you don't think God's ever going to get through to, God brings life out of barrenness. God brings life out of brokenness. He brings growth out of people who seem like they've grown cold to God. The person that might be a Christian that you know hadn't been in church in years, God can bring healing, hope, renewal. And that's what he's telling his children is, if you'll think about what I've done in the past, you might not be so surprised at what I plan to do in the future. Verse 3, what is God going to do? The Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He'll make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. He's going to bring new life. He's telling the children of Israel, look, you've been invaded. You've had your cities burnt. You've had drought. You've had famine. You've had the crops destroyed. But guess what? You look out here and see this broken mess, and I'm going to bring it to life. I'm going to give you hope. You and your life, when you see brokenness, when you see a sin that you just can't seem to kick, it keeps rearing its ugly head, when you see a relationship in your family that's broken, when you see your own home shattered, when you're walking in a marriage that is going through trouble, when you're dealing with loss that you think you're never going to get out of the cloudiness, God looks down and he says, you know what I can do? Is I can take that hopelessness and I'm going to take that brokenness and I can put life there. But who are the ones that should be looking for it? The ones who are seeking after God. And when God does it, we shouldn't be shocked. When God brings hope, we should understand that He loves us and cares for us and what the rest of the world sees as worthless and invaluable and useless, God sees a potential to put life and to do something with it. And how should we respond? With joy and gladness. This is what the end of verse 3 says. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving in the voice of melody. This means that when God is at work, The response of God's people, if we're listening for it, if we're looking for it, then what should happen when we see it happen is we respond to God with thanksgiving and praise and worship. I'm going to tell on myself and my fellow pastors. A couple years ago, I was sitting in a Dyer Baptist Association executive board meeting with pastors from all over meeting together as other churches. And I only tell on them because we had to do some soul searching that night after what happened. Uh, If you've never been to an association business meeting, don't go. They are long. If you've ever been in a church business meeting and don't find those are fun, you imagine a church business meeting made up of mostly pastors. You know, we're going to have a 45-minute debate over whether we need to put $52 in this account or the $52 in that account. Or whether or not our next meeting needs to be a fish fry or we're going to have fried chicken. Now that's serious though. We debate and we discuss and people go to the floor and they make a motion and they have all this dispute and discussion. Well then, I I believe it was Alicia when she was directing the BCM. She's not here. Y'all are my imaginary Alicia this morning. Uh, I think it was when she was still directing the BCM. Got up and gave a report on a mission trip that the BCM students had taken where they had had the privilege of going down on spring break to Panama City Beach and they would basically pick up drunk college kids and feed them pancakes and give them a safe ride to their hotel. And they had the privilege to that week of leading, it was like over 20 kids to Christ. And it was crickets from all of us Baptist ministers. After speeches and debate and discussion over fried chicken and $52, one pastor stood to the floor and he said, what is wrong with us? Because what happens when one lost sinner repents in heaven? The angels themselves rejoice. 
Yet when God works in our very midst, we sit there frozen and still and silent. But when we see God working, our response should be praise and joy and thanksgiving. Why? Because how does God do it? I'm going to just summarize what we've read. But God says, I'm sending justice, or He has sent justice. How does He send justice? What is justice? We talk about criminal justice, right? These people who've done wrong who need to be brought to justice to try to make it right. If I was God and I sent justice, and I'm glad I'm not God, my way of sending justice would be to look at all of these rebellious sinners, strike them down. Pew. Throwing a lightning bolt would be so much fun. But I'm not God. I think with a human mindset, God thinks with a holy and righteous mindset. So what does God do? Because I'm going to give you a hint. All of us are those sinners that deserve to be cast down and struck down. How does God send his justice? He says, I'm going to send my son. Okay, And he's going to go into that world and he's going to live. And he's not going to sin. He's going to be just. He's going to do it all right. He's going to be right and righteous in all he does. But he's going to die. The one who shouldn't have to. He's going to suffer. And he's going to pay the penalty for all of these who should perish. He says that if we'll believe in him, if we'll trust in him, we will be saved. That's how God sends his justice. By pouring it out on his son who gives his life for us that we can believe in him and be saved. Then in verse 6 he begins to say to look up to heaven and to look down at the earth. So basically looking all around you and he says that the heavens are going to vanish away. That the earth is going to grow old. The earth is going to pass away, basically. And that all who dwell in it will die. Now, that's not a good spot, like I said. But what we need to understand is that this world, because of the sin that's in it, in a sense it is a wasteland. That it's passing away and that there will come a time where this earth will pass away, where all will die. So what do we do? We trust God to do the thing he said he was going to do. He says, but my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. That though the heavens and the earth are passing away, we can trust in a salvation that will hold us eternally. God is, this is coming to Isaiah hundreds of years before Jesus ever shows up. But God said, this is what I'm going to do. I love this passage because it kind of lets us see a little bit of God's full story, of God's full picture. It kind of shows you the already that has happened, the things that are at hand now that God is playing out in the gospel and the things that are almost here. His coming when Jesus comes back, when this world passes away and when God reigns eternally. And what does he call us to do in the meantime? He says, for the believer, seek the righteousness Seek God. Give Him praise when He's at work and to trust that He's still at work. And be part of it. We get to be part of what God is doing. And for those that don't know Him, trust. You say, but preacher, I'm too far gone. Preacher, I've sinned too much. Preacher, I don't have it right. I don't have it figured out. What does God say? He says, look, I can put a baby in a woman that should have never had a child. I can make a great nation out of barren people. I can take the desert and snap my fingers and it becomes a beautiful garden. I can certainly save your soul. And for us as his children, why do we doubt? Why do we think, you know what, that sin got me again? Well, why do we think, well, I'm just down and out today? Why do we think, oh, there, there's nothing God can use me for to steal from my brother Jackson Sunday night? 
Why do we think he's done with me? There's not a plan or a purpose. When God's saying, I'm at work. I'm saving. I am healing. Be part of it. Today, maybe as a Christian, you need to recommit yourself to that. It's the day you say, I'm done playing around. I'm going to trust. I'm going to be on the lookout for what God's going to do. I'm going to listen up. And I'm going to jump in and celebrate and serve and worship because of who he is. And I'm going to trust that whatever mess I'm in, whatever brokenness, whatever loss, whatever barrenness, whatever sin, God is able to work. And you need to come and you need to recommit yourself to him and say, I'm coming today, I've trusted him, I've been saved, but today I declare that I desire to renew my commitment to following after him. Maybe today you've never known him. Your heart feels that waste, that brokenness. Maybe you don't have it all figured out, but neither do I. But what I can tell you is that God has come. He has sent his son. And that he promises life and a never-ending salvation. If you'll come and know him. Pray with me. Lord God, we love you. We thank you for your grace.